I was talking to a Labour whip a couple of weeks mm-hmm. ago who I bumped into and I was like, all right, come on, mate, level with me. What's going on with Brexit? And we were going back and forth. And I was like, well, here's my sense of what you would have to do in terms of general election, which is offer to renegotiate and put it to a confirmatory referendum. Yeah. That's all you could do to please both sides of your electoral yeah. And coalition. that would be a very sensible outcome of the election that I think would provide us to be able to, again, talk about the material issues of people's lives. But one of the things that he said was, look, if we come out and back a second referendum in full throat, we're going to get killed in the north. And I was like, oh, come on, I've had a look at the data, it's not that bad. And he went, no, 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 that's not what I mean. I mean that Labour MPs in leave seats are receiving, Mm -hmm. even now, death threats, harassment and abuse on a scale which has got lots of them genuinely afraid for their lives and what they're worried about is in the event of a second referendum they will become targets for far-right extremist terrorists the way that joe cox was for thomas mayor and there is a real a real danger in that and it's something that was raised actually at the plp this week the PLP, the Parliamentary, Parliamentary Labour Party. Yeah. So meeting. every all Monday, the all the MPs meet, and it was a joyous meeting today because uh, this week because we um, uh, had a new MP joining us, so that was it. Started off well, and then of course, as always, we end up arguing over many things. So you know, there was a heated discussion on many issues, but Brexit was one of them. And it boils down to, we understand all of the facts that Labour MPs will be targeted. And there's a real danger. So do you as a party change your position because of that? Do you effectively allow terrorism to win? You know, the message of Ken Livingstone after the 7-7 bombings was London is going to get out and we're going to open up our shops and we're going to keep on our business the day after. And do you then allow the threat of right-wing terrorism suddenly to provoke a different response from no, you? No, but my question no, 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 no. is... But, but, so then the party's response shouldn't be a policy change. The party's response should say, we understand that things are now very different, difficult, so maybe actually we do need to employ more security. Maybe we do need to employ bodyguards and support for those people. And it is a difficult moment that you get through. But do you allow that resentment? And that resentment exists there. It's not just being invented by Brexit. It exists there in those communities. But there comes a point where it has got... Do you just paper over the cracks and hope that it will go away? Or do you actually need to confront it? And you need to say, we think that there is a majority in this country that are decent people that are not going to be fooled by this real minority of um, loons, uh, right-wing terrorists, who are going to try and hijack this issue. And we're going to be able to um, uh, pursue a policy. Or do you change your policy because you're worried about it? And I th- would prefer the, the, the other one. I mean, I'm inclined to agree, but having first-hand experienced some of the racist abuse and harassment after the referendum Mm -hmm. result and since then having kept a fairly close eye on how far-right organizing tactics Mm -hmm. have changed how they've been able to grow how they've been able to see their talking points repeated back to them by tory mps people in power people who are considered part of you know the legitimate discourse has me very concerned for how that referendum would play out. And one of the things that um, concerns me especially is that any polarisation between no deal and no Brexit would benefit the argument for no deal because it has the side of, well, we already have a democratic mandate and that was given in 2016. Mm -hmm. And what you're doing is you're gifting the far right who have been fringe for so long Mm. a mainstream talking point to build on rather than saying well you know what the mandate in 2016 and 2017 was for a soft brexit compromise here you are that's your referendum fulfilled that's 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 where uh, there wasn't really a we we don't know what the mandate was after the last referendum it was a a big fudge because it was so close i think that's why most people who want a kind of confirmatory vote is they're talking about a confirmatory vote on the deal. They're saying there is a soft Brexit here, Theresa May's deal, and if you are a real Brexiteer, I mean, the reality is if you're a Brexiteer, you should be voting. 
I'm not going to say this. I shouldn't say this because I don't want them to vote for it. But you're voting for a bloody dip. Because in five years' time, you can tear up a lot of the things. It's only the Northern Ireland backstop that's getting them all agitated. And when they're not in coalition with the DUP, they can just leave Northern Ireland in a customs union and we can leave it. E- exactly. So so I don't actually understand... <coughs> so, so what you do is you put that back to the people and you say, look, there is a form of Brexit here that probably fulfils most of what you wanted versus remaining. Is this actually what you wanted now? So would no deal be on the ballot? Well, my preference now and I've changed my mind and I am liable to change again because I think it's a movable feast is that you wouldn't if it was a May deal or a version of May deal no deal wouldn't be on the ballot paper if it was a customs union or a kind of EEA Norway plus I think then you increase the danger of having to put no deal on the ballot because those aren't really leave options they are giving up all control options but following all the rules and what many of us said on the campaign trail in the referendum was the very worst would be would be a kind of Norway because my analysis of what you happen with Norway is actually that helps the far right far more because what happens is the far right come away saying we won that vote we've left but we're still following all the rules and so you still get all the anger you still get all the frustration because they feel like the liberal elite as it were you know if we can, have stitched it up they've stitched it up and they haven't even kind of gone back you can't even say you've gone back to the people because we have actually stitched it up because a norway option is a stitch up norway is let's accept all the rules let's accept all the free movement let's accept everything this is what common market 2.0 basically is it's norway plus you know we accept all the rules and that leaves a really awful anti-democratic taste in the mouth. I mean, people who are saying, look, we think this is a tragic mistake. In democracy, you allow minority voices to continue to be heard. In democracy, you do put tests back to the people at regular intervals. And the, my view is that the referendum was a mandate to negotiate honestly and truly and offer a Brexit that could work. That is what May has effectively got. I think it is a disaster, and so does a lot of Remainers think it's a disaster for the country. The democratic thing is putting it back to the people. The undemocratic thing is doing some smoke-filled room uh, kind of stitch-up. And what you see in Norway now is this bizarre situation where the leader of every single mainstream party in Norway is in favour of joining Europe. Every single trade union is in favour of joining Europe. Every single business is in favour of joining Europe but they can't garner the popular support of the people. And slowly, in Scandinavian countries, you see that now rise of the far right. And we, of course, see it in an awful way in in, 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 in some of our sister parties in Scandinavia as well. Does that connection work? Because, I mean, you see the, the rise of the far right in Norway yeah. and in Sweden. Mm-hmm. Sweden's yeah. in the EU, Norway's yeah. in a um, non-EU relationship. I don't see the, I don't see yeah. the and relationship And I was going to say, there. I think that's got less to... The rise of the far right in... Norway and Sweden has mm. less to do with um, institutional arrangements between those countries and the EU. It has much more to do with issues around national identity, around uh, yes. the idea of the presence of Muslims being an, an existential threat to the nation, to the people, to the culture. And and that's the thing which I, I kind of want to loop into You're this totally discussion. Right. And, but is that not the basis of the far right rise really here? Is that not, we're talking about Brexit, but really we should be talking about um, the fact that these other things are causing the rise of the far well, right. We of shouldn't course, be using of course. And, 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 and that's the thing that I wanted to move yeah. on to, actually, is that, you know, in saying that, well, actually, I think that Norway is the worst of all worlds, is that I worry that you are validating the far right far too much because actually I don't think very many people care about the precise institutional arrangements between the UK and the EU. I think the reason why Brexit went from being a fringe to a mainstream issue in the course of a relatively short period of time is because Britain has, you know, enjoyed by virtue of its former imperial status a half in half out relationship to the EU it was one foot in one one foot out you have all these opt outs and you also have a political class and this was the thing which you know Boris Johnson was the master at uh, concocting and wielding and firing up which is happy to blame the EU for anything that you Mm -hmm. don't like in this country and do it in a way which is like look at these people they're so unreasonable Mm -hmm. and Um, all the good things the requirement to introduce a national minimum wage, disability, discrimination, all of those stuff, you never hear 
us going on about how fantastic the EU was. In fact, what you hear is us saying, in 97, when Labour came in, we introduced the national minimum wage, we introduced the Disability Discrimination Act. Yeah, all required by EU law. But we never say that second part, do we? We pretend that we take the glory. And so when it's good, we pretend it's British. And when it's bad, I'm agreeing with you, we pretend it's European. And, and at the same time... There has been, a, and this was the thing which I, I was in a very roundabout way looping mm-hmm. back to, is use migrants as a very convenient figure, mm-hmm. an embodiment of all those changes that you're experiencing that you don't like. They're an embodiment of your loss of control of the political mm-hmm. landscape, the social landscape, your immediate surroundings as well. And that's something which... Uh, New Labour played like an absolute fiddle. David Blunkett was, um, you know, an artiste at that. It was something which David Cameron did very well. And then suddenly you've got all these figures saying, no, 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 stay in the EU. My concern with brushing off Norway is that you're saying, oh, look, it's the worst of all worlds. You don't get your control back. You don't get this back. You don't get that back. Well, actually, it gives you the space to say, we fulfilled the result of your referendum, which is, you know, severing ties with this political institution that you don't like as much as we can. But what we're going to do is build consent and make the argument for something like freedom of movement. And I feel that that was a wasted opportunity. You, I think that we tried to do that. I think that Labour Gen... I mean, I was not a proponent. I spoke against pushing for a people's vote early on in the PLP. I spoke up about that, and numerous of us did. So I, I agree with a lot of your political analysis of where we've come from. But the question is, where are we now? What are the solutions out of this madness? How do we get out of it? If we could, without an awful backlash, just a, a revoke Article 50 and end this madness, I would do it. I suspect that will be accusations of a greater democratic outrage, actually. Mm -hmm. Now, I think there is a case to be made about saying, and it might well be, it has to be after a referendum, uh, so after a general election, not before, you know, kind of Labour's manifesto pledge becomes, Mm -hmm. we will try and negotiate a new deal and put it back. But somewhere along that process, I think we probably now need a confirmatory vote. One, because time has lapsed. Uh, By the way, I don't buy the argument that so many people have died and so many new people have come to the referendum because actually over 80 year olds voted predominantly Remain. Um, Mm. It was kind of a a, a, a hump in in a few... It was the boomer hump, the baby boomer hump. The pop psychology is that that people in their 80s still remember the war. Yeah, but I'm not I don't know if that's true. Well, it is interesting. My My grandma can't remember much of anything. (laughs) My my, my grandmother came over, German, came over um, to Britain and all barring my dad of her um, children voted leave. I went to visit her, she's bedridden now, but I went to visit her a few months ago and she pulled me over to the bed and she said, don't tell the others, Lloyd, but I voted Remain because I can remember what it was like. So maybe the pop mm. psychology maybe is true. right. Yeah. I don't know. That's I mean, enough evidence for me. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, on, on that level, kind of maybe it's, it's, it's uh, kind of right. But so actually the ageing demographic may actually hurt the Remain cause. So let's not, let's not pretend just because of... T- but time allows space for new thinking. Time allows space for different approaches. And I think it is dangerous to set a precedent that says you can never come back to an issue. Now, so then you get to an argument of, do you have to have fully implemented the referendum decision before you can ever put this back to the people? And my analysis is we'll never fully implement this referendum decision for even if you have kind of a no-deal Brexit, you're going to be then in negotiations with the EU, discussions around how things happen for, as I say, five, ten years. And so you're saying that you've got to wait five, ten, twenty, thirty years before you can ever even engage in this issue. After 75, the people who wanted to leave immediately organised and started to to make their case. And And so I don't think that we should be ruling out a period of time to be able to make that case and saying, oh, no, you need to have a truce in that period. I think if there is a groundswell of feeling that it's a way of putting this issue to bed, and of course it won't put the issue to bed uh, in the public, Uh, it won't put the issue to bed in the kind of general politic, but it will put the issue to bed in Parliament and allow Parliament to then deal with the material issues that affect people. And if Parliament doesn't 
deal with the material issues that affect people and continues to focus on Brexit, that is, I think, actually the bigger danger for democracy. People start to say, hang on a second, you can pass all this emergency legislation when it comes to Brexit, in one day the Cooper Bill, but what the sweet FA are you doing about universal credit? You can pass all this emergency indicative votes on our future relationship, but what are you doing about my local school or my local hospital or housing that is in disarray? And there's a real problem that if we don't start getting Parliament talking about serious issues, we undermine fundamentally the very basis of British democracy. And what if Remain loses? What if no deal won on a three-way well, ballot? if it was a three-way ballot and no deal won, we would be in an extremely difficult situation and I would be incredibly depressed. But it would be life, wouldn't it? And you would have to pick yourself up I would, of course, then make, assuming that this is a ballot that is an automatism, so it's not a ballot that says Parliament goes back and negotiates a deal. So we have kind of three mm -hmm. option deals that have already worked out. It <clears throat> automatically happens. To some extent, I don't get a choice. I can continue a campaign, and I probably would continue a campaign, just like comrades in Norway, just like other people, to say we want to go back in the European Union eventually. And probably I would be on a long journey to get there, <laughs> to get the public uh, on my on my wavelength but it would be my democratic right as a politician and as a citizen to continue that fight just like when women lost the vote twice in Ireland for abortion the next day they got out there and they started organizing to have another referendum very quickly so they could get their right for abortion in Taiwan last year when they lost the vote for gay marriage what we actually said to people in Taiwan who are campaigning on this, we said, find any way possible legally to stop it. Stop it in the courts, stop it in Parliament. Yes, it's a referendum, but this is your right to try and stop what you think is a, is a moral outrage. Now, I think we've got to be careful about just saying Europe is some moral outrage of that mm. level. But I think we also have to recognise that a lot of this discussion isn't really about trade anymore. It is about how we see ourselves is about whether we see ourselves as European. And I know from the South East, I visited France and I have family in Germany and far more than I... Uh, I the first time I went to Scotland was when I was you know, 20. You know, kind of in terms of what but binds feeling, the union but together. feeling European isn't a human right because, I mean, then you'd say... No. So, so, so say if Scotland won, won the independence referendum and then the British people in Scotland say... But it's my, I feel British, I have a connection to London and therefore I'm not going to respect yeah. the result of the referendum because it's my identity. No, but they would continue, they would to, continue to campaign, wouldn't they? You to can continue rejoin, to campaign, yeah, yeah but um, and, and trying, this, to, trying the, to stop the, it in the courts the word, is somewhat different, right? Well, well, they would, wouldn't they? The word respecting result is a, is a funny word, but I think there is an interesting crux here about citizenship. And our understanding of citizenship is still based on this Westphalian kind of model of a kind of geographic territory that is drawn and that turned into the kind of the the understanding that we have in the Montevideo Convention where if you have a unit a subunit within another country you could declare independence and you could have nationality the European Union started to move nationality in a very different way it started to destroy the importance of nationality at the nation state level and started to allow people to actually, maybe a minority, but some people to be able to see themselves beyond British. And actually, in my view, it cleansed Britishness. Britishness that had a really negative history and a really negative connotation. And the same is, in my view, has happened in France and in Germany and Belgium. It allowed these post-colonial countries that the reason that the colonies had existed is because they were in competition with each other. Britain was in competition with France, and so it was a race to see who could conquer the rest of the world more. Britain was in the race against Spain, and it was a conquer who could conquer the rest of the world. If you stop these countries fighting each other, you bring them together, you create a post-colonial world, but also also, you create a post-nationalistic world. And that was the direction of travel that I think some of us, not all, a minority maybe, were trying to push the European Union in. Lloyd, you had me and then you lost me. <laughs> and, and this is exactly where you lost me. Because, tell me, it is interesting. Yeah. Simple question. Mm -hmm. Do you think as many black and Asian minority ethnic people who voted Remain consider themselves European as part of their identity as white people who voted Remain? Probably, probably not, because identity is a very multi-layered, multi-faceted thing. And it might well be in some BAME communities they do, and in other BAME communities they don't, because also 
BAME communities in that sense are are very multifaceted as well. I... I, 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 I think would it's argue it's, it's, not, I, I, it's not just about identity and the layering of identity, yeah. it's also about the layering of history. Yeah. So this analysis of... But Euro- identity Euro- is based of, on history. ...of, yeah. of yeah. Europeanness yeah. allows uh, Britain, mm-hmm. France, uh, you know, Italy to cleanse itself of its colonial past. Well, you know what, say that to, you know, the people who have made the journey across land from sub-Saharan Africa through Libya, been detained and then drowned in the Mediterranean. Mm-hmm. You know, you can't tell me that the European project and European identity, which has been constructed institutionally by defining itself against the restriction of such freedoms to people from the global south, cleanses itself of coloniality. No, I think you make a a good point there. I I think it's a bit unfair to blame the European Union on the migrants drowning in the Mediterranean. I think that there are European Union states that are continuing to allow that to happen. It is their waters. But the European Union doesn't per se support that. In fact, the European Union was supporting funding for vessels to continue going out until very recently, despite the objections of those countries. And it's only stopped because Italy has effectively invoked its powers to prevent the European Union continuing to go It goes back longer than that. But I get your point. There was yeah. more ease of migration for people from North African countries, for instance, up until the 1980s when Schengen starts kicking in, then you have a sort of parallel restriction no, of those more, rights. The, there were more ease of migrants, whatever your background and whatever your nationality, pre-1900. And from 1900 onwards we have seen a ramping up of restrictions, whether it be on the Mexican border and the US, whether it be um, anywhere. And in fact, passports didn't exist as we know them now until uh, the 20th century. And so you've seen an arc of stronger and stronger restrictions. And the only way that we've been able to reduce those restrictions is try and create units like the European Union. And now that has been based on very flawed ideas around economic prosperity and probably people that look, sound and uh, seem the same as the majority in the respective countries. The word white is just one syllable. (laughs) Um, it's It's not as simple as just saying white because there's also a discrimination between what Brits perceive as white French versus Brits perceive as white Bulgarian. You know, so so Mm. that's why I was trying to avoid using that. But levels of whiteness Mm. maybe is a way you could Mm. describe it in a very crude kind of way. And yeah, I get that there's a problem there. But the question is, how do you deal with it? Do you do you deal with it by trying to smash the whole thing down? And my view is the danger is what you end up to is going back on the trajectory of toughening Mm -hmm. um, visa immigration requirements or do you start to build blocks and cooperate together so then what you see in between Kenya and Uganda and Tanzania now and other countries in that region is the developing of a free movement block where you can move work freely and they base it on the European model and now Europe negotiates with that block on wholesale we have complete free trade between that region between uh, um, uh, Kenya and the European Union there are no trade barriers at all on anything apart from arms which I personally would ban arms trades entirely so I've got nothing wrong with that and now there is discussions about how you can start to make visa liberalisation between those trade blocks and so do you see that as a way of getting to a stage where we can right the wrongs of building these walls and fences which you're quite right have been built or do you see a way of kind of destroying the block and in a kind of in this kind of chaos and i say chaos rather than anarchy because anarchy is a system of governance and chaos is a, a system of nothingness you know kind of in that chaos you hope something to come out my view is the danger is in that chaos in this period in time the likelihood is likely to come out is the rise of really right wing nationalism it's very dangerous in a different period of time in a in, in 10 years time or if we manage to change the world quicker than that I actually think there is a really good case mm-hmm. for breaking up the European Union my analogy and I don't mean this in a, in a sometimes people balk at this analogy my analogy is that I think there's a really good academic case to break up the United States really spot on it's too big it's too centralized the president has too much power etc etc if during the American Civil War you were trying to make those kinds of academic arguments about why America was going to be a superpower. 
not only were you a genius because you could see in the future, but actually you just weren't seeing the time and the place. The Confederates who were trying to break up the USA were doing it for the wrong reasons or the wrong motivations. And no matter how much of a good socialist or anarchist or anarcho-syndicalist or whatever you would have been, and there were anarcho-syndicalists around at that time who maybe wouldn't have used that tag but would have had those kinds of views of self-organisation, you would have been siding for the wrong people with the Confederalists and you probably would have been not a racist yourself but you would have been enabling a system that was propagating racism. That is my view of where we are in Brexit now. There are very good friends of mine in the PRP have presented to me very, very good arguments for why Lexit is a really potentially good argument of why actually we just need to respect the referendum result and maybe we do break up the EU and maybe in that break up you know kind of or you know us leaving the EU something grows in between that's amazing and we get kind of Corbynism my view is that actually that is less likely and my view is it's more likely to get a Labour government with Jeremy Corbyn if we fight a kind of remain corner and it's an analysis that I could be totally wrong on but I actually don't think there's going to be any winners or there's going to be no there's no solution where everyone's a winner and everyone's a loser there's going to be so, there's a bit of a grayness in the middle